Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. Today we're going to talk with a Utah state senator who is an ex-Mormon and an atheist. Senator Derek Kitchen will tell us why he changed his mind about religion, why he ran for public office, and why he became a plaintiff in a case that struck down Utah's same-sex marriage ban. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker, co president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this show. Senator Derek Kitchen represents Utah's second state Senate district, which includes most of Salt Lake City. So, Derek, thanks for joining us today. Hey, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So what a story you have. Um, you were raised Mormon, and then you ran for public office in Salt Lake City. But before we talk about your, uh, your campaign and your public service, uh, tell us what happened. You were raised Mormon, but now you're not. What happened? <laughs> Well, that's a big question, sir. Um, and uh, it didn't come uh, easily, for sure, growing up in a place like Salt Lake City, uh, dominated by by Mormons and people of faith. Um, and so growing up, it was always expected that I would be a member of the faith. Uh, I was baptized into the Mormon faith uh, at the age of eight years old. A couple of years after that, I was about 12 or 13 when, you know, you hit puberty, you start questioning things in life. Um, and I had, uh, the internet was new in my family at the time. And so I was able to get all of my questions about, you know, God and life and everything, you know, sort of was uh, available at my fingertips, so to speak. And so, you know, as a questioning young person, um, it was easy for me to find community of other like-minded, uh, free thinkers. Um, and I stumbled upon a pretty large uh, community of, of atheists and uh, found, um, obviously, atheists have their own worldview and not everyone is the same. But certainly it was heartening for me to realize that just because I was surrounded in the flesh by only Mormons, that um, to see that there was more out there uh, was really eye opening for me. And so um, I was pretty young when I first told my family that um, I didn't think I was Mormon and that I didn't believe in God, at least not in the way that they had sort of sold it to me. And so um, that certainly opened up a you know big family dialogue. Um, I was the first one out of the um, spiritual closet, right? But um, uh, a few years later, um, others have followed. And uh, I think just by coming out as an atheist early in life, it allowed people in my universe, in my orbit, uh, to begin to question their faith as well. Well, well, if I can borrow a word, that sounds pretty inspiring, that a young person would just have the independence of mind to think for yourself. You mentioned coming out of the spiritual closet. You had to come out of two closets as an atheist and as a gay person. What was the reaction to your family or to your community to you being this totally, I guess, the opposite of a Mormon now? Yeah, I mean, it was rough at first, especially, you know, in adolescence. It's a rough time of, of life for most people anyway. Uh, then you add on just being the black sheep in my in my home uh, as well as in my community. Uh, but, you know, I, I find that finding my own truth and, you know, trying to be open and honest and transparent about that is an empowering um, experience for me. And so that's true with my, my spiritual beliefs, uh, my atheism. 
as well as uh, with my identity as a gay man. And so, again, I feel incredibly empowered. But it was rough at the time. Um, and, you know, you got to keep in mind, I came out before, you know, Barack Obama was elected. It was, you know, re leading up to the Prop 8 campaign in California. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit more in a minute, if you'd like. But certainly that was... Um, a big a growth experience for me growing up in Utah and seeing the Mormon church underwrite um, taking away liberties from yeah. people uh, like myself in California. Maybe you were the white sheep of your family. How do you know? Could have been the other <laughs> way. So what, what do you think is harder, coming out as gay or coming out as an atheist? Or are they both equally difficult? For me, and I'll speak from personal experience, um, I, coming out as an atheist was a little bit more challenging for my family to wrap their mind around. Hmm. Um, but, you know, you got to keep in mind this, you know, early in life, 2006, 2007, uh, being a gay person was not uh, widely accepted in the way that it is today. And so it was, it had its own challenges for sure. Uh, but when you talk to somebody about faith and spirituality and lack of, you know, religious belief, uh, it puts them on the defense pretty quickly. And so I found that finding strategies to diffuse people's natural instincts to sort of throw up their elbows, um, you know, I've found some unique ways to do that in my community here in Utah, where a lot of people are members of the predominant faith, which is the LDS, Latter-day Saints, or Mormon faith. Uh, but, you know, you see it within uh, all kinds of, you know, religious communities that, you know, you identify yourself as a nun or somebody that's not part of, you know, uh, monotheistic religion, you, you know. N-O-N-E, it, not nun, N-U-N. -N, correct. Right? None, none of the above. None. So, so anyway, it was challenging, but here we are. We're, we're, we're making good progress. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 33 years old now. And, uh, you know, certainly I'm the only one in the Utah legislature that identifies as a non-believer. Uh, but I know that uh, others are holding their, their own reality close to the chest, and I'm not the only one. But everybody doesn't need to come out. I don't expect everybody to be out and proud about their atheism. It's a personal thing, right? So you're 33, you're going to outlive Jesus, aren't you? <laughs> he was supposedly, if he ever existed, 33. So uh, before we talk about your public service and running for office, which must have been a challenge in Utah, um, when you were in your 20s, you sued the state over, was it a, a gay marriage ban? What was that? Uh, Kitchen versus Herbert, right? That's correct. Uh, so I'm Derek Kitchen. Uh, governor Herbert was the state's governor at the time. And so, yeah, back in 2013, I was fed up. <laughs> I, you know, 23 years old, uh, wanted to um, begin to live my life as many of my peers uh, were, which was starting a family, getting married, going through the motions of um, early adulthood. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I joined a few other plaintiffs and launched a federal lawsuit. We sued our governor um, and our attorney general in federal court. Uh, we, our complaint was that Utah's constitutional ban on gay marriage violated uh, my own constitutional rights as a, as a citizen in the United States of America. And we were laughed at at first because, you know, it was on the heels of Prop 8 where, you know, the, again, the Mormons really underwrote and funded the Prop 8 campaign in California. A lot of the feedback I was getting from people at the time was like, good luck, man. You know, like Utah, it'll be the last place on the, you know, on earth that allows gay marriage. So, you know, God bless you, but it's going down in flames. And, um, you know, that may have been, you know, a reality that we were wrestling with, but um, come uh, December 20th of 2013, a federal judge uh, struck down Utah's constitutional ban on same-sex marriage, and Utah became the first federal lawsuit in America to strike down a state marriage ban. So we crafted in that case a really critical case law that ultimately led to the Supreme Court ruling in 2015 that uh, same-sex marriage uh, was a right for all uh, LGBTQ Americans. Then you ran for public office. And, uh, you know, I'm an outsider to Utah, so I have this simplistic stereotype. There are a bunch of polygamists, simple, you know, I mean, and of course it's not that way at all. Being, did being ex-Mormon hurt you in your campaign or did it help you? Well, you got to keep in mind, I live in Salt Lake City and, you know, 
We are unique. Salt Lake City is very blue. We're very progressive. You know, we've had a lesbian mayor. Uh, when I was on the city council, uh, half of the local elected officials were members of the LGBTQ community. We pride ourselves on being a place of diversity and acceptance and acceptance and inclusion. And so when you talk about Salt Lake City, it isn't the state of Utah, right? And so we're very much different culturally speaking. But it's worth noting that when you have such a dominant cultural force like the Mormon faith here in a state like Utah, it creates the environment that really facilitates a strong and tight-knit counterculture, right? Mm. And so Salt Lake City is a really lovely place. We have a lot going for us. Um, and so I, I find that, you know, me being out and proud uh, for who I am, um, unabashedly queer, um, uh, non-believer, um, and I find that that was not really a topic of conversation among my constituents and the voters in my district. Uh, but when it does come up, I think people find a sense of kinship, right? Because it's like, oh, he's an outcast maybe like me, or he's not of, you know, the predominant, you know, cultural, um, you know, uh, faith here. And so I, I think in many ways, it's, it's an asset for me to be myself in a place like Utah. So you gave the voters a real choice. They were able to vote not just against Mormons, but to vote for you and for the values that you uh, represent. So then in the legislature, you have been involved in some legislation. Weren't you involved with conversion therapy? It was yes, there a, and so, a bill passed? That's right. You know, um, we keep talking about the Mormons and the way that they, you know, uh, participated in uh, taking away rights for LGBTQ people in California through Prop 8. And certainly they had a hand in passing our own marriage ban here in Utah in 2004. Got to keep in mind, 2004, that was George Bush's reelection. He really, you know, rode that uh, guns, God, and gay sort of uh, wave. And so um, a lot of places around the country really uh, went after queer people. Um, but, you know, here in Utah, we've uh, been able, since marriage has been legalized through my case, uh, we have been able to um, force the hands of the powers that be around here uh, to come around on important matters relating to, to the LGBTQ community. A couple things worth noting. Um, we passed a statewide non-discrimination law, which codifies legal protections for gay and lesbian and transgender people in our community. That was huge. Think about the Equality Act, which sits before Congress right now. Utah has our own version of Equality Act, and we passed that about six years ago. So we're really proud of the work that we've done on non-discrimination. Uh, a few years later, we were able to get the Mormon Church to the table, um, and they helped us ban or not uh, ban, uh, pardon me, to pass hate crimes legislation, right? So um, uh, penalty enhancements for people that target and harm LGBTQ people. Uh, most recently, really proud of our ban on conversion therapy. Utah has historically been a place for um, a lot of really questionable practices when it comes to trying to convert queer people. Um, and, and so, Banning that in a place like Utah is a huge success for us, and I'm really proud of our work there. And so over the last couple of years, we've done some really meaningful work in protecting the LGBTQ community. Uh, certainly, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us. I'm anticipating uh, some policy proposals this next year that seek to uh, uh, prohibit transgender girls in particular from participating with their peers uh, in high school sports. Um, and there's a number of bathroom-related legislation, which is completely unnecessary. Uh, so there's still a fight to be had, but uh, we've got some successes under our belt that I think will catalyze, um, you know, a meaningful dialogue uh, going forward. Wow. So we're going to take a break here, uh, and after the break, I want to ask you about the story about the Mormon Church hoarding billions of dollars, not spending it on what they promised to spend it on. So when we come back, I want to ask you what you know about that. Uh, this is Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation after the break with Derek Kitchen in the Utah Senate. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. 
That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Charlotte, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. I've always been intrigued by religion, and when I was younger, I desperately wanted to be religious, to be more accepted by my family, who was in majority Catholic. My parents didn't raise me religious. I was never baptized. I never took communion. Well, once I took communion, uh, it was a pretty bad idea. I don't think it was worth a church full of angry elderly who glared at me as I waved the communion wafer back and forth asking my grandma what should be done with it. Also, the wine was pretty gross. From this experience and countless others, I came to three conclusions that sort of dictate how I live my secular life. One is that I find people of faith to be more exclusionary and less accepting. Two is that I would rather work to please the people around me who I care about than someone who, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. And three, that I would rather help people than pray for them. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker, and we're continuing our conversation with Derek Kitchen, who is a member of the Utah Senate. And uh, Derek, of course, as you just heard, had to come out of two closets, ran for public office successfully, and has had some significant victories in legislation since he's been in the Utah Senate. So uh, another issue that I've been reading about in the news, uh, Derek, and maybe you can fill me in on this, uh, uh, it was discovered that the Mormon Church had what do we call it, a slush fund or some, some money that they had sent aside of billions of dollars that they were not using for the, what they promised to be using. What do, you, what do you know about that story? Yeah, this is a groundbreaking uh, story. I believe the Washington Post broke this a couple months back. Uh, we learned that the Mormon Church, through their private equity investment arm, has been taking uh, tithing, uh, the funds that they get from their members, um, and investing it. And now they have hundreds of billions of dollars uh, at play. In fact, during the GameStop saga earlier this year, I don't know if you recall that, but uh, the Mormon church actually made a significant amount of money on that, which I would argue is gambling in, in many regards. So, uh, but yeah, the, the Mormon church through their investment arm, they have billions of dollars uh, that they've amassed over the years. Um, and I think that it's calling into question, you know, why? And why are they not using this for, um, the general welfare of the community and their members in particular, and instead are out there making money in the stock market. Um, and so you're seeing that a lot of high profile members of the faith and former members of the faith uh, are coming forward and no longer offering their tithing, you know, their 10% give. Um, and uh, even James Huntsman, brother of the former presidential candidate, John Huntsman, has actually sued the Mormon Church, requesting that he get all of his tithing back because he doesn't think that the, the Mormon Church has managed that very well. Um, there was some news over the, the last week. Um, a tech billionaire out of California, Utah native, resigned from the Mormon Church, brought his entire family with him, and he donated you know, the better part of half a million dollars toward our local LGBTQ equality organization here in the state of Utah. And so you're seeing that uh, with the revelation that the Mormon church is using their tithing um, to profit for themselves, um, yeah. it's pushing people away. Yeah, why give money to a group that doesn't need it? If they've got a hundred billion, how does the hundred billion dollars compare to this Utah state budget, for example? <laughs> I mean, if we had $100 billion, uh -huh. like, I have a lot of things that we could do with that here to help the community at large, housing being a big one, right? But uh, uh. yeah, I mean, it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, not, that's not to say that the Mormon church doesn't do good things in our community. They certainly do. Uh, but it shouldn't be uh, at the expense of good government, right? And the fact that their members are, many of them are struggling, right? Uh, there's been a big divide between rich and poor, especially with the pandemic. And uh, that's no exception for Mormons. And so uh, I would really love to see um, us have a meaningful conversation about taxing 
churches, especially when they're engaging in economic activity like this and generating huge profits for themselves. Uh, it, so there's certainly a policy conversation to be had about that. At least taxing that part of their income that is not directly related to ministry. So what should happen? Should there be any what, legal repercussions? I mean, what do you recommend should happen in this case to the church? Well, again, you just said it. I, I think if they're going to be out there engaging in the economy and, uh, you know, growing their their uh, pot of money um, through, you know, genuine economic activities, the same way that you or I may do that, uh, and we would pay taxes, I think that they need to be paying taxes on those gains. Uh, yeah. That seems like the bare minimum. Um, and then at the end of the day, I think it's really important that we are just really careful not to continue to institutionalize religious ideology in government. And you see that happening not only in Utah, but around the country, especially when you start talking about uh, hot button issues relating to you know, a woman's right to choose or whether or not to allow gay people to get married or what have you. And so I think that you know, if the Mormon church is going to engage uh, in economic activity and, and earn a lot of money because of it, they should be taxed. So in a few minutes that we have left here, um, can you talk a little bit about um, Utah is a big state with the, the so-called troubled teen industry, and it's coming out that there are some scandals or some, some problems with that. Are you involved with that in any way? Yeah, we, we uh, made a real genuine effort this last year to uh, more uh, meaningfully rein in uh, the troubled teen industry. And for those of you who don't know what this is, briefly, this is when... Um, Usually rich children like Paris Hilton or Lindsay Lohan have substance use or mental, mental health issues. Um, they send them to Utah for recovery. And we're a, a state that's rich when it comes to uh, outdoor activities and the mountains. And, and nature can be a really meaningful place to heal. Uh, and so I think that there's opportunity to do that, but not at the expense of the emotional well-being of these children. Um, and certainly not when abusive practices are put into place. And so we've made some meaningful progress at reining that industry in here in the state of Utah. One of my daughters actually went to Utah on one of those things about 20 years ago. And she loved the nature, but boy, she hated being preached at. It was, it was, it was almost more of a spiritual thing than an actual physical thing. So in the couple of minutes that we have left, uh, if you don't believe in God, what is your basis for being a good person? How, how can you claim that you have any moral standards in your life if you don't have God? That's a good question, man. I mean, I don't believe in God in the traditional sense, but that doesn't mean that I haven't tapped into my own sense of spirituality. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't about fighting religion, at least not for me. It's not about fighting religion. It's about embracing spirituality and inviting people to think for themselves, first of all, but also showing them that there is a place for them in the universe and in our community. And so I think, you know, just by showing up for my community, showing up for my constituents, you know, advocating uh, for the things that people care about, whether that's, you know, clean air to breathe or clean water to drink or affordable housing uh, or, you know, all of these issues that matter to us. I, I think that whether or not we talk about God is sort of irrelevant as long as I'm doing my job um, and I'm advocating for the things that people actually care about. And that is good government. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, our founders predicted that it was going to happen. Right. But we need to make sure that we are not institutionalizing religious beliefs. You know, a good quarter of the you know general public are identifying in this uh, non category, N-O-N-E, right? And um, millennials and Gen, uh, Gen Z uh, folks are, you know, not identifying with religion, at least not in the way our parents had. So uh, I think that it's totally appropriate for atheism to exist in the public space. I'm proud to be an elected official, both at the city council level for a couple of years and now most recently in the state legislature. Uh, I'm proud to stand there um, and not take the prayer with my colleagues on the Senate floor um, and instead, you know, focus on good government. Have you had any repercussion from that? Any complaints? No, but, you know, I did um, offer my own uh, non-religious prayer uh, mm -hmm. to the body uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, um, you know, I think just trying to show them that um, because I'm an atheist doesn't mean that I'm you know, bad. Uh, and so I think trying to find common ground around, you know, my own spirituality, my own beliefs, my own sense of right and wrong in the moral universe, uh, we find a lot of common ground there. And so if they see that I, I can, you know, operate the same way that they do while also not having God, I think that that's something that I'm proud of. 
because we all know that most religious people, whatever the religion, they're good people. They're, they're in their faith because they want to make the world a better place. But it's not exclusive to them, all human beings. All of us can be good people. So what's on your agenda? It must have been pretty exciting when you were in your 20s to get all of this attention and suddenly, you know, that gave you some electability. But what are you looking for in the future? In terms of elected office, you know, I'm up for re-election this next year. Um, Utah is a changing state. Uh, we just got the census data. Utah has been the fastest growing state in the country over the last 10 years. And in fact, we're set to nearly double in population in the next two and a half decades or 25 years, right? It's massive growth, right? So in addition to being fast growing, we're also uh, the youngest state in the country. The median age in Utah is 30 years old. Uh, so we are ripe for political change. So despite being a Democrat and an atheist and a member of the minority party here, I have confidence that in the next couple of election cycles, we're going to see significant change. Uh, we're sandwiched between uh, formerly red states, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Nevada. Utah's the tipping point. We're next. So I'm feeling really energized about the uh, electoral side of government here in the state of Utah, and I'm going to keep fighting uh, in the legislature uh, for as long as people will be willing to, you know, elect me and put me back in that office. I really am so grateful to serve in this role. Wow, that's very encouraging. Would you encourage more young people to get involved in politics? Yeah, and in fact, I've been working on my own little internship, uh, mentorship program. So the goal is to bring young kids, young students, young adults into my office during the legislative session and show them what it's like, what the process is like, talk to them about their electability, about their vision for the community in the future, and show them that if I can do it, you can do it too. So if you're interested in government, there's a role for you to play, whether that's in elected office or uh, an appointed role on a board or a commission. Um, you know, there's we need all people to jump into government right now. And you see people doing it on the right uh, all the time. Uh, and that's why you have big fights around school boards, right? And curriculum and banning books. And uh, we need people who care to get involved. Well, thank you, Derek Kitchen, Utah State Senator, for being on Free Thought Matters today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.